So a little bit about myself, and this is not about me, but this is to give you a little background about where I've come from and how I feel about this time versus experience. Uh, I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1990. I got my private pilot's license at the Aero Club <laughs> in 1988. I started flying in 1987. I was a soaring instructor at the Air Force Academy. I went off to pilot training, went to your Air Jet pilot training in 1990 for T-37s and T-38s. And if you all remember what happened in 1991, we had this thing called the Gulf War. Well then, after that, there was this big drawdown, right? So I got the auspicious uh, goal of becoming a banked fighter pilot. So I did well enough in my class to, to get a fighter, but there were no fighters for us to go fly. So I said, I want to get as close to aviation as I can. So I ended up getting a job at the 421st Fighter Squadron in Hill Air Force Base. Uh, F-16s, they had just gotten back from the Gulf War. And I'm like, okay, I did it. I got some place that's good. But I'm like, how am I going to sit around for two years and not fly? Because I want to get some, I'm going to get some flying and some experience. So being a, as Joe knows, kind of a, I, I'm not, there's no one I haven't met that I don't like. Uh, I go to a local airport because uh, they have a SGS, they have a 123 and a 233. I'm like, hey, I can start flying a fighter. Well, I come to find out they need a tow pilot. Um, I don't have a tow tailwheel time. So I find a United guy who's got a tail, he's got a super cub. Well, long short of it later, I end up with a super cub. More to follow on that. Um, after I got done with my two years of him doing that, I went off to uh, A-10 training, and I flew A-10s in both Korea uh, and Tucson uh, in the active duty. I uh, met Pete Ponce at that time, I actually got to fly with him a fair bit. And after that, I got out of the active duty, I got hired by Delta in 2001. I was on my first leg of OE Airborne on 9-11. I started the day in an MD-88 in uh, Fort Lauderdale, I ended the morning in an F-16 over Chicago. So, that was kind of a short end, uh, a quick end to my airline career for at least a while. After that, um, I got into various industries and stuff, so I ended up flying uh, a lot in the guard. Uh, we converted to the F-16. I, I got hired by Fort Wayne in 1999 to fly F-16s, and I was flying F-16s at the time then. Fast forward, I come back uh, to Delta in 2006. Uh, I worked in management, I worked in the OC Operational Control Center, uh, I've flown Pretty much everything we had except the wide bodies, uh, typed in the DC-9, the 737, the Airbus, the 756, 757, uh, and I'm a lead line check airman right now on the uh, 717, which I've been doing for the last, been a lead for the last six months, and I've been a uh, check airman for cumulatively about four years. So I come from a little bit of a background too, uh, GA. I had that Super Cup first when I was a lieutenant. Uh, I said, well, bigger, better, faster. The people that uh, took me under the wing in Utah taught me how to fly in the backcountry. I had been all throughout the Intermountain West in that Super Cub. Uh, I ended up buying a 54 180, kind of did the same thing with that. Uh, older matured, now I get a wife, kids, mortgage. 180 goes to the wayside for a while. Back in Indiana, buy an A36 with my dad. Uh, he's like, why are we flying a single engine airplane when you can fly a multi? I'm like, I don't know, Dad. I don't have money. Uh, so we ended up getting a partner and had a Baron. Did that for a while and then got out of GA for a while. Currently uh, own a Cessna 185. Uh, had that for the last six years, which I have flown extensively in the backcountry. All that being said, does that mean I have a lot of time or experience? I don't think it means anything. Because I am a student of aviation. I'm here to learn. And that's what I want to do at all times. Aviation is one of the most humbling exercises you can ever participate in. And if you ever think that you're better than that airplane, or that weather front, or that, that flying canyon you're flying up, you're going to pay for it with something very dear to hopefully your, your loved ones. And you won't know it. So I have always been a, you know, a student of, of aviation. So I ended up with, I, you know, I've got about 3,000 hours of general aviation time. I have 4,000 hours of fighter time. Let's call it 10, 12,000 of, of airline time. And to me, that means nothing. Okay? It's the experiences that I have learned throughout this time, which makes which I you know have tried to impart upon the people that I fly with, the people that I teach, and hopefully you guys take back to your CFIs and the people that you are running your uh, your shops. So a couple stories. So here I am, a lieutenant, uh, you know, graduated pilot training. You know, I think I'm somebody, right? I've got this, I've got this super cub. I'm flying the mountains. 
Uh, I've been taught by a very experienced uh, U.S. War Service pilot. Uh, I got my table check out from Yankton, South Dakota, back to Ogden, Utah. We did 54 landings. This was in 1991. So I flew that airplane probably 300 hours uh, in a very short period of time. So I'm a lieutenant. Yeah, I'm good. I've got my instrument rating. I've been through the best pilot training that the Air Force has, you know, that the military can provide. So I'm thinking, man, I've got this. I'm good to go. So what I do, I go out and do something stupid one day. Uh, I was flying my Super Cub with one of my dear friends in the back seat. Has anyone heard of the moose stall? In the, the vector? You know, you've flown back country long enough, you've heard of the moose stall, where you get yourself distracted, you're in a canyon, you look you lower, a little lower, you pull too hard, the nose comes up, and there are flint shutters, and then it snapples, if you're not careful. I did that exact same thing. I did that exact same thing. And I was only probably 200 feet when I did that. I had time, I thought I had experience, but there was one thing that saved me from that. I was a spin instructor at the airport together. I had probably done 300 spin stories. So I knew what the airplane felt like when it was about to depart, and my immediate recovery was unloaded, instinctively. I thought I had time, but I had an experience that saved me that day. So there's one foot stopper of experience. So far, I haven't got myself in that situation again, but that one experience, I translated for, to not trust time. Uh, let's see, moving on. So I'm flying A-10s in Korea. Uh, I was an instructor at the time. I had been flying A-10 for probably three, four years. Uh, if anybody's been in Korea, the weather over there is usually not very friendly. And this was in the early 90s when we're not in a radar environment to speak of. It's all procedural control. Uh, A-10's world, we weren't getting a lot of parts. So the weather was not great. I was taking a new wingman out uh, to instruct. So the weather was about 500 overcast, tops 20,000 feet. And in the A-10, when you do an instrument trail departure, it's all procedural. You take off, you set pitch and power, you get two miles spacing, you have air to air attack in between the two aircraft and you fly out with pitch and power. Well, I'm about 5,000 feet, and I get an off-flag in my ADI, and I get an off-flag in my HSI. I'm like, oh, well, this sucks. But what did I do? I didn't do anything. I was flying 800 ITT at seven degrees nose high on my little standby ADI, knowing that I'd get on top, and then we have to come back. So we get on top, we rejoin, get on my, uh, I get on my flight, I get on my wing, wing and I say, hey, you just got to bring me back, and we'll land. I'll do a formation landing off you. Everything goes great until we do the ILS, and he gets nervous because I'm on his wing, and he gets all over the place, and I have to tell him to go around, so we have to do a missed approach. I'm like, oh boy, this is great. So we get back up in the weather, and it's weather in Korea is, I'm not flying the dark green A-10s, I'm flying the light gray A-10s, and everything's the same color. So I've got my hands full just staying on my, my flight leads. I mean, my new wingman's with the wing. Gas isn't an issue, but the weather is because we don't have any weather anywhere, and I don't have an ADI. Uh, you can't shoot an approach on our standby ADI because you have no guidance, and the HSI was gone too. So I just get on the, on the radio and I said, Charlie, and I just called him Charlie, I didn't call him Les Paul, and I said, Charlie, just fly your airplane. Just fly your airplane. I will not lose you, I promise. Came back around, shot an approach, done. Not a problem. That worked out really well for two reasons. I had time in the airplane and I had experience. And the experience that Charlie got from that was to learn how to just fly his dumb airplane, no matter what the situation was. Charlie went on to become a weapon school instructor in the A-10, dear friend, but that experience taught me another valuable lesson. You have to have faith in what you know about your trade. I knew that pitch and power were going to say, we're gonna be my guidance right there, and I knew I had a plan to come back. That was the experience. So, I moved this forward to um, Balad in 2006. Um, we were flying F-16s at the time. We had some of the worst weather in that part of the country, or part of the world for like 50 or 60 years. Abysmal storms, water everywhere. Uh, it was just not, the runway there was, when, when it would rain, you just find powdery dust and it's like, it's, it's almost like snow on ice, uh, little snow pellets on ice. And the Blad runway, uh, which Blad was just north of uh, Baghdad, had a big bump in it, right about 6,000, 5,000 feet down, right about the time in a fully loaded combat F-16, 
where you would rotate, and it was no, no issue. So, sit in the order, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, um, the klaxon goes off, launch, so we have all our stuff on, we jump in the jet, and literally we're rolling down the runway two, like four minutes later to go to what's called a troops in contact. Well, my flight lead takes off, and mind you, it's uh, maybe a mile biz, maybe a half mile biz. It's as, as dark as the inside of a basketball uh, at midnight in Milan. It, it's like shooting yourself off a, off a carrier. I've not done that stuff, but there's no light. So, 150 knots, I'm going to lift the nose, the airplane, I hit that bump, it squats really bad. And I get brake X's in the HUD, I get and my ADI down here, I get brake X's there, I get off flags there, and I get off flags in my uh, HSI. And all my master caution panel's going, and you know, at 170 knots, I just lifted off, 180 knots, after have a cooking. You can't afford it. You're going airborne, you're going flying. So now I've got, great, I've got no system. This sucks. So, we're in the weather, uh, tops are like 10,000 feet. My flight leads already telling me to contact this agency, that agency, this agency, because he can talk to the guys that are getting shot at. And mind you, what had happened uh, six months prior, uh, six weeks prior, a guy from Toledo died in that exact same day. He hit that bump, lost his system. Um, he went straight to his radar to try and find his flight lead, and ended up the airplane like this down and just before he hit the ground he realized it and tried, tried to pull and correct and uh, it didn't work out. So I knew that in the back of my mind. I had had the experience before of losing an ADI in a kind of a critical situation in the phase of flight. So I did what I thought was natural. I looked at my little standby ADI, it's kind of the same one on the A-10. I put the nose at 15 degrees nose high. I left this in the fourth quarter, the afterburner cooking. And I watched my altimeter increasing and my airspeed increasing, and I'm going to roll straight up. I'm going to fly here. I am simply going to fly here. Uh, as it turns out, uh, I was able to get my system back eventually. Uh, my flight leads like, "Hey, what's going on back here?" He's asking me to check for the display. I lost my entire system. I need, I need a little lead time back here. I get up above the weather. I get to your plane about you know 10, 15 minutes, doing what we need to go through the checklist. I get the system back and end up accomplishing the mission. The mission. So, I take from that experience is, I didn't have a lot of time in F-16. Uh, I had a couple hundred hours maybe. Uh, I was a fairly experienced fighter pilot at the time, but I didn't have much time in the jet itself. So that jet will kill you in a heartbeat if you're not careful. And I knew that. And I used the experience from before of fly the airplane first, no matter what you do, fly the airplane. I took that experience from you know, losing the ADI in the weather in Korea uh, to that to this situation. and I. I think that's another reason I'm here today. Also, unfortunately, Sonny's accident, um, that experience. And this is a, that's a key point. Um, all the experiences that we have in aviation don't necessarily have to happen to you in the aircraft. So it's, you know, sessions like this, talking to your fellow aviators, talking to your instructors, finding out, hey, how was your day? What'd you learn? What'd you do? Um, can be exceptionally valuable. And I think we've kind of lost the art of the group. Uh, in a lot of respects. So, because we're doing what? We're just trying to build time. So, what in the Air Force, we had a, a terminology, you know, a term or a time that we thought was the most dangerous time uh, in a young pilot's career, young fighter pilot's career, and I'm driving about 500 hours. Um, GA is, a, what's, the, it, what's the time in GA? Is it 1,000 or 2,000? What's that? 400 hours for Dr. Craig. 400 hours for Dr. Craig. With a new IFR rating. Yeah, with a new IFR rating. So why is that the most dangerous time? Why? Because you don't have enough experience. You don't have enough experience. You don't, you don't have enough experience, no, you don't have enough experience. That's exactly right. And that's the exact same thing that happens you know, to a young flight lead in the Air Force. Uh, as instructors, it's incumbent upon us to give our students our, that, that's, those experiences. And as we are starting to pump you know, students through, you know, CFIs through, what's everyone focused on? And you heard Josh talk about it earlier. You know, it's the golden ring at the end of the, at, at the, end of the rainbow being you know, an airline, you know, flying for the airlines. It's all about money, right? So what have we lost in that translation? I think we're losing the experience because we're just trying to build the time. And that concerns me. That concerns me greatly um, for two reasons. One, 
We don't want to turn aviation into just a, for lack of a, a J-O-B, okay? And I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but you know, I'm passionate about flying airplanes. If they're bigger airplanes, little airplanes, uh, I have been so blessed in my aviation career to have been able to fly so many different types of aircraft in so many different types of situations. I, I'm very experienced now, but I'm still very, I'm still on guard. I don't get complacent. I don't go, I got this. You know, yesterday I flew my 185 from Detroit Metro over here to Oshkosh and across the lake. You know, is that a risk? It is. But my experience tells me I'm at 8,500 feet. I only had eight knots of headwind. I'm flying 155 knots true. I flew across an Isman. Uh, so I was out of fun glide and I, I timed it 13 and a half minutes. Is that a risk? I had flotation and everything else, but I had experience to back that decision up. Now I knew that I would put myself in somewhat of a situation, but experience allowed me to do that. In the, uh, you know, growing up as, as a young uh, aviator in the military, I had a very old Sage uh, F 16 weapon school guy sit down and he goes, All right, JC, I want to tell you something. I go, What? He goes, you got two things when you're learning how to fly these fighters. And I go, what's that? You got your bag of love and your bag of tricks. And I went, well, what the hell does that have to do with it? He goes, you ever heard of scales of justice? And I go, yeah, you always kind of want to balance. He goes, sometimes you're rather be lucky than good. <laughs> sometimes you're going to be better and you're going to have, you know, build your love with experience. I always remember that because anytime I get a valuable experience, I try and chalk it up or I'll share it with someone or I'll put it in my blog. And I think experience over time is very, very expensive, very, very important. A friend of mine, uh, when I was a lieutenant at Hill, uh, he was a CFI, I was not, uh, was checking out a 25,000 hour airline captain in a barrel. What could possibly go wrong, right? What could possibly go wrong? So they're down at Heber City, it's a B-58 Baron. They are just about to lift off, and what does El Capitano do? He races the ship. They get his race in the flames. Before my buddy could, oh, no! Because he was sitting there, he's 25,000 hours. What the, 18 He can do everything, right? Oh, he's got 25,000 hours to a nut at times. So, and that's kind of the way I've always approached, you know, my airline flying, is I do it passionately. I try and do it professionally. And I try and learn something from it each time I do it. Some days, you know, are better than others. But I try and build that experience. That's why, you know, I enjoy teaching. What can we do in, uh, you know, what can we do as instructors in GA to build experience? I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. I've got some thoughts. Or what you can teach, you know, as flight school operators and stuff, what can you provide to your instructors as leaders? Go ahead, sir. <coughs> We all know that if somewhere in the instructor process we have to teach skills. But beyond a certain point, we need to realize that every time we get in an airplane and go from A to B, we just blew a scenario. So we need to focus on scenario-based training. And it has to be the right scenario-based training, meaning the instructor shouldn't be sitting there, oh let me show you this. Yep. That that's not the scenario. That's not the scenario. The scenario it's relevant experience, and whether you do it in the sim or in an airplane, we need to move from task base to scenario base, and I would take the leap and say competency base training. How do you hit the nail on the head? And my point in that as well is, you know, most flight schools have, you know, their standard reports that they're going to fly to all the time. They're going to fly up big because they CFIs are familiar, right? That's what they want to do. It's easy. They know that stuff. Uh, they're not getting any better. So they're getting a lot of time, but they're not getting any experience. So some little things that I think of, you know, that we can you know, have our CFIs do, or, or you know, the people that are, you know, our, our chief pilots in, these, in the flight school saying, hey, when's the last time you went out to such and such grass strip? Have you ever, have you gone to, oh, we planned on doing this airfield today, but halfway there, send your student over here, see what happens, okay? That's the divert. Has anybody here ever divert? Anybody here ever had to make a weather call? Anybody here ran out of gas early? I mean, those things have happened. And when we you know, get in these big scenarios, we aren't giving our students the experience. Yeah, our CFIs are building time, 
but they're not getting any better pilots. Yeah, they're, they're really good at beating up the pattern. Um, anybody ever had an avionics failure? The tremendous reliance on the glass is just astounding to me. Have you ever reached over and turned off the, you know, either figure out short trigger to kill your GTN 750 on the student, or possibly turn off the avionics master switch if it's not going to hurt the, you know, the setup that you're in, and see how they deal with it. Fly into busy airspace. CFIs hate busy airspace with students, because it's hard, it's work. But that's where the experience is. I was in Nashville last week, um, giving a line check, and we were hit hole number one in the 717. Here comes a Piper Arrow <laughs> with a student pilot soul, young lady. And I'm like, God bless you. And she goes, you know, Piper Arrow student, 1432, uh, on final for 2 0 right. And I'm like, yes, you go. I thought, and I was applauding the instructor too. You know, I think she probably come over from John Tuner or something like that. And I'm like, awesome. This is, that is valuable experience. She's going to be a wonderful aviator someday. And I applaud that CFI. Those are experiences to me that truly matter. Um, you know, partial bandwidth breasts, you know, yeah, that's all good stuff. Within your flight schools and stuff, I know we have syllabi. You know, but I think it's important that within that syllabi there is the ability to have some challenge and you know force your instructors to maybe go some places that are maybe just a touch outside their comfort zone. I'm not saying do something stupid, but if we keep doing the same stuff over and over and over, we're building time. We want to build any experience. Uh, it's it's very very astounding to me sometimes. So. Little scenario here, maybe outside the you know the realm a little bit, but so as a line check airman, I fly with all types of new students. Uh, I can fly from the right seat, the left seat, doesn't matter. But you know, most of the time I'm upgrading new hires, and I'm on a, a new hire fleet, so this could be someone who's never ever flown in the airlines. And I'm in the right seat, so I got a 1500 hour, let's say F-16 pilot. I got a 4000 hour regional pilot. A 1500 hour part 91 corporate pilot. So, who do you think is going to have the most time? Who's going to have the most experience in those group, in that group, and why? Well, they're going on that, but I'm sure it's wrong. Part 91 corporate pilot. They are the worst. Really? They can be. I would have thought they would have seen the most. Yeah? You know what, though? That's a really good option. You would think they've seen the most, but they don't. They do the same stuff all. They do the same stuff. For most of those operations, Joe, they don't fly like you do. Uh, they go to the same spot all the time. They go from Fort Wayne to Naples. They live over at Naples to Fort Wayne. That's it. They never go into the busy airports. I see. Because they're, they're really uh, corporate uh, commuter pilots. They're corporate commuter pilots. Yeah. But they they don't have the experience of, of the regional pilots at all. Not at all. So I was thinking that same thing. Until one time I was flying uh, with a student. Uh, first landing in the Minneapolis, I happened to look over the left on the final, the next thing on the far was come to Iowa, uh, 50 feet, I'm like, ah! and it turned out to go, and I go, what was that? Uh, the student says, well, in the Falcon, we always pull the power at 50 feet, and I go, does this look like a Falcon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't think of that. I go, yeah. <clears throat> so, important, they, you know, no experience, you know, no experience, it, 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 he was just rope flying. 50 feet. Um, interestingly, that $1,500 fighter pilot who's never can't even speak Part 121. You know, the, the, the funny thing for us, this ramp frequency you, you can speak of, because uh, you, know, you have to talk to ramp before you get pushed, which is something they've never done. You're thinking, oh my God. I took uh, a guy into O'Hare this winter. Four legs, we did no hair turn, and we went someplace else. He'd never flown 121. And if you've let, ever flown into a hair as a pilot, uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, especially during a snowstorm, especially if you're single seat in the left seat, uh, because you are, and then you can barely flip the switches at times. And I said, I promise you, by lake four, I made the de-ice every lake two. You've never done that. Um, and I said to him, I said, by lake four, you're going to be comfortable with this. He goes, there's no way. I said, there's no way. I said, you don't have the time in this airplane, but you've got experience, and I know you can learn fast. And we did, and by lake four, it was like he'd been doing it his whole career. I was amazed. 
but he had experience doing very challenging clients in his career. He also was a professional learner. He had been out of his comfort zone a lot. And he was he knew he was out of his comfort zone too. And that's the other thing, you know, the, the time versus experience is knowing when you're out of your comfort zone. If you never get in out of your comfort zone, you don't know where your comfort, you don't know where your bubble is. Uh, I've gotten out of my comfort zone unintentionally probably too many times. So I, you know, try to, you know, I've tightened down a bit here and there. So I have to be careful with that. But I do want you guys to emphasize to your instructors, get out there, get experience. Don't just get, you know, wrapped up in time. Time will come, but the experience matters. I think experience matters much more than total time. Uh, I really, really do. But it's up to us to figure out, teaching our instructors how to go out and do that and translate that to their students. And sometimes you can just sit there and let your student learn and come back and say, tell me about this. this is, and then that is, that's a piece of experience that they will take along with them and it will make them a better safer pilot uh, in the end. So get your students out there. You know, I encourage experience. Get your students out there, get your CFIs out there. Uh, if you're a chief pilot, get out there and fly with your CFIs. Have them take, you know, have them come up with a brief and fly and say, no, let's go here. Let's do this. Let's see what happens. Um, when you have the time, I know everyone's exceptionally busy, it's expensive to fly the airplanes if you don't have the time. Same thing in the sim though. You know, these red bird simulators are wonderful. Uh, I happen to have grown up in simulators, you know, being my 121 world, so I get a lot of experience in the simulator. They are an absolutely phenomenal training. Phenomenal training. And you can garner a lot of experience from your scenario based, I mean your scenario based simulator training. So do that. Challenge yourself and challenge your, uh, your instructors. So, where am I? Am I time or experience now? Wait a minute. Well, I'm an experienced person myself. Yeah. But <clears throat> it has to be the right experience. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, my son uh, got his private pilot's license last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, he flew every day. And out of a class, uh, Charlie Airport. Yep. And it was great. But uh, I got to know his instructor who is now going to Republic, I think. Mm -hmm. And I took him on, I don't know, four or five turbid cross-country business flights as the left seat guy. Mm -hmm. And each flight that we took, he faced something he had never experienced before. Always to do with weather. Mm -hmm. And including his first uh, approach to pretty close to minimums, about 100 outcomes. And I'm not saying this because I, I was delivering something here. I'm saying this was normal flying to me. Now, it took me years to make have yeah. that be normal, but it was normal flying to me. It was not normal flying to him. And that's because the uh, operating standards for the flight school prohibited him to have any of that stuff actually happen to him while being an instructor yeah. with a commercial rating and a CFW. And I'm thinking, well, this is how Colgan happens. Is it, that's exactly how the public happens. And so, yes, I understand prudence and margins. I mean, I'm the guy that's talking about that downstairs this morning. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, he's really gifted technical pilot and doesn't have any experience. And he didn't get any on the way to his ratings that are putting him in an airplane seat. So I guess my question is, is that okay? Is that just the way it is? Or could you imagine an alternate universe where the syllabus produces more experience. Okay. Uh, John. John, okay. And, and Joe, forgive me for knowing him, but I, I agree with you. But I've seen with the other instructors that I've interviewed at our place, it's like, have you done this? Have you ever landed on grass? Sure. Have you ever done this? Have you, have you ever had to figure out how to get in, how to get around a bunch of cells? That kind of thing. And it's all, all you can very whatever. And, so I think what's happened, and maybe Paul will agree with me, I don't know about that, I think what's happened to us is that we've been so focused. I don't hold the airlines a little accountable for this, by the way. I don't blame you. Um, we've gotten so
so focused on the 1500 hour rule mm -hmm. and getting everybody to pump through the system as quickly as possible that we've forgotten how important it is to get to the edges of the end, challenge ourselves in a safe way, yes. and learn these things. The experience Joe provided at CFI is invaluable. Um, a friend of mine, Craig Elmara, Chuck Airman at United, mm -hmm. or Chuck Airman, um, in the 400, he said, yeah, I've got thousands of hours flying to Hong Kong. Me, half the time I'm sitting in first class. Yep. <laughs> the rest of the <laughs> okay. you know, because because of the fly out this right. So what does that mean? So we need to to encourage instructors during this time. If they're going to be here to get the experience to get to the airline and get the portable job, we need to we need to tell them, yeah, go out on. And if you're scared, go out on those days that are a little challenging or go do some of And if you're scared, go find the old instructor that will know on the property or the old pilot who's done this that you know that you can trust. Yeah. If it's a strong crosswind, don't be afraid of the crosswind. Go out and learn how to cope with it. Because sooner or later you're going to anyway. Yeah. So that's I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I know I'm I know I'm I know in the choir talking back to the pastor here. So I apologize. No, that's okay. No, that's that's how I feel. I feel the exact same way, and I'm just yeah. wondering how do we how do we get over that bridge? Go ahead. Well, you're touching on a lot of topics. I I, I understand. Um, one that comes to mind is you know we've all made our stupid mistakes, but I actually have created a presentation in the airlines, and it's called "Never Waste a Mistake." Yeah. Yeah. And the principle of it was. Mistakes should be shared and learned. And if you see somebody else make a mistake or you read about it on CNN, don't vilify the poor crew. Figure out what happened so I don't do this again. Or it doesn't happen to me. But there's another thing we haven't talked about. You spent a lot of your time talking about building experience in the airplane, which is great. You can also build experience on the ground. Yes. Um, I mean, you know what a loft is. I don't know if yeah. everybody, line oriented and flight training, you have to do one of those to kind of get through your program. Just did one last week. But you can do a ground based loft. Yes. You can sit down and create this scenario and talk people through it when the wind is so bad you can't possibly fly. So yeah. turn that time into ground time because I think we're losing a lot of opportunity to teach people ground school. Definitely. Because ground school doesn't count towards hours to build time for the airlines. Yeah. So instructors are. Cheating yeah. for students, fundamentally. Yeah. And to build on that, it's the old saying, learn from the experience of others because you can't possibly live long enough no. to experience everything yourself. And as an old great, as an old instructor myself, you're just great. That too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> appreciate that. But as an old instructor or experience perhaps, I can't be embarrassed too embarrassed to say, this is where I screwed up. I have to share that with my students. Because yes. I don't want them to make the same silly mistake I made. Yes. And yes, I you know, I am far from a perfect pilot. Guilty. I make mistakes every day. Yeah. Wait, you have to fly the perfect flight. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Yeah. Which one did you mean? Okay, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. Yeah. There's one thing that could summarize this, I think. Change the discussion from time to experience to quality. Yeah. Whether you've got a 500 hour pilot, you need to do quality training. And that was actually, you, you, you took my clothing from me. Because okay. I appreciate that. Because the whole idea of this, time versus experience, doesn't matter. That's correct. It should be quality. Yeah. I mean, the only reason we have the time experience now is because of the congressional world. Exactly. It's all or, up. It's or an all accident. Quality. Or an accident where flight time was not a problem for cause. You know, it's one of the things that we used to do in the in the fighter community is you always, every sort of you brief the training rules for the day, you know, for the mission. And you say, um, even though we brief these every single time, these are written in blood, mm -hmm. so pay attention. Yeah, I don't know if you do this at Delta. Um, I, I eventually did it at my airline, and it, there was some level of mutiny in the pilot group, of course, when they saw this. But at the very last item on the checklist, very last, was debrief, mm -hmm. and it was just a simple reminder. 
for the crew to say, what could we have done better? Yep. And as a captain, I always started the conversation by saying, well, I think I could have done better on my airspeed. What do you think? Yeah. And that would open the door for me to say, you know, next time uh, pick up the flaps, wait until I call to the checklist. Yeah. Hey, two minutes, and you can do self-instructing, because sometimes you can't do ground school when it's happening. Yep. You, you just have to create a point in time to say, let's chat about this. And I'd suggest that one way I think we can improve this flight instructors is to ingrain that debriefing habit in all of our trainings. Mm -hmm. You know, so that after every flight they take all the time and mm -hmm. the kind of thing Joel does. Every time you land, yep. think through what went well, what you want to work on the next time. Because yep. we're learning on every single flight. That's so on the business model side of the industry. Mm -hmm. Business model. Yes. Side, okay. We have more and more schools that won't even let a student and customer bring an airplane go so long during yeah. their training. Yeah. Yeah. There's a collegiate program that has that policy in place right now with their partner independent classrooms. And I just spoke to somebody. Is that a lie? Or is it? It, it, it is, and we're starting to look into it now to okay. understand it because I said to the student, I met a student, okay, from a gym that I go to where I work out. I said, so you cannot go and rent an airplane VFR, forget I'm said no, it's against the policy of the institution. Wow. And and so there's a lot more to this. Yeah, there there's is a lot more to this. There is. Well yes. that's a good that's a really good observation too, because I, I was fine with a newly hired individual who had, let's say, a couple thousand hours. He had just been hired. He taught at a school, um, building his time, and we did an approach, probably to O'Hare. Two hundred and a half, and when we walked into the day, he said, "Well, that was really cool." I said, "What my landing?" He said, "No, I've never, ever, ever in my life flown an approach to minimums, even simulating that." I even just had that in, in, in actual condition not too long ago, and I went, "Are you kidding me?" And the and the problem with that is, is that we all have our first. Yeah. It's just that we don't expect it there. Yeah. There. Yes, yeah. 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 sir. Yeah. Yeah. One question. You're an LCA. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a close friend of mine. He's a senior LCA at the big airline. Mm -hmm. It's not your job. Mm -hmm. Many hours. International 7 6 run. Yeah. Okay. How much pressure do you feel, as a, and you're a younger LCA, mm -hmm. to bump somebody over the other side with diversity, equity, and inclusion? But can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah. How much, as far as if, I, let me, can you frame that? Bump them. How do you, you When it's time for an upgrade. Oh, okay. If I'm upgrading them, or if you're ever giving them to check right. Yes. Where does DPI come into play? It doesn't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. You're either going to meet the standard or you're not. Okay. Period. Period. Mm -hmm. That's what the standard is for. Uh, I'm also on professional standards committee for our union, and we have a DEI portion of that. And we have this sector of DEI that's trying to say, well, we need our own post stands, we need our own this, we have. Well, like, no. Are you a Delta pilot or not? Yeah. Period. Yeah. So. So, uh, getting back to the general aviation side, before we send more reviews, yeah. <laughs> one of the things um, that I encourage my instructors to do, I do it every flight, is I just sit down across from the student or learner, and, per se, and I say, the debrief starts with, what did you learn today? Mm -hmm. Every single flight, and I encourage every instructor to say that. Let them teach me. I and learned something, and I just sit there and stare, and if they don't have an answer, I say, well, then I'll make suggestions. But usually they, they come back to their own view. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, you've been patient. Oh, uh, okay. So it's a couple points. One, I teach at the University of Utah. When I first started there, our safety manual said 500 foot ceiling was our minimum for mm -hmm. flight, so we can't get down to uh, minimums. Yeah, too high of our minimums. So ended up rewriting some of the policies. That you know, at the intended airport landings that we're going to patent in the view, yeah. it's got to be a certain ceiling. But we can go down to Madison, book Madison, and when it's zero zero, and shoot the approach there down the minimums and bonus, mm -hmm. and, and catch people get that uh, experience that way. Um, and we also changed our policy about couple versus non couple approaches, a you know, hand flying approach, uh, the higher minimums. Uh, and coupling the other down the minimums. Uh, so our safety management system has a piece to that. But 
Let me be too aggressive question. You talked really about your training as a military pilot. What's the day that and better or worse than we, the training we have as GA pilots? You know, the general rule is just 61 yeah. pilot versus and you get 750 rule. They, so going through military pilot training is, is an absolutely immersive experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, you live, breathe, and eat. Uh, learn how to fly a T-37 or a T-6 to, in today's Air Force, and then a T-38 for a year, a year and a half. That's all you do. You're getting paid to do it, so you don't have the, you don't have, which is key, okay? You don't have, and you're not paying for it, okay? So you don't have the distractor of one, oh my God, I'm, I'm not $125,000 in debt. <laughs> uh, and I don't have the job. Um, well, I gotta build time so I can become an airline pilot. Um, one, two, you're flying with professional military instructors on every resort. Uh, not to say that we don't have professional instructors in here, but the military takes pride in how the instructors are selected and how they're trained. Air Force and military flying in general is very, very, very regimented. There's, it, it is, and it's done for a reason, because Expensive equipment, it's a dangerous job. Uh, and we don't want people to get hurt. So that brought, when I learned how to do you know, that military flying, and I, I got a taste of that at the Air Force Academy to begin with, because our aerial was structured that way, and the soaring program was structured that way, somewhat. But then you step into a T-37, uh, and I'm flying with a German F-4 pilot, we have like 4,000 hours of F-4 time. Uh, it's a new level of revenue. So that brought a certain discipline to how I approach flying and kind of a mission mindset. And I still try and you know, put that forward in when I fly the 185 uh, or I fly GA, um, and I've kind of applied that too to, you know, Delta's very regimented as well. But I think that, red, you know, they don't allow you to get outside your comfort zone. I mean, well, you're uncomfortable to begin with because it's just so much. It's very structured, it's busy. Um, you've got to know everything cold. Uh, and there's no margin for error because you, you're two rides, you're, you're, three, you're, you're three days from getting thrown out every time you show up. So there's you know, a little added stress right there. So did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, you kind of brought through things we could take from your military training to do the 141 or 61 for our Yeah, it was. So let's, um, you know, structure, support, uh, having some leaders, having some senior flight instructors who are willing to sit down with the junior flight instructor and say, hey, how's it going? What'd you, what'd you learn today? How, you know, and overseeing that. That, you know, guys like you, my hat's off. Uh, you guys are the, and you, you guys are the salt of Europe, and we need that. Uh, because you are, you are leaving lasting impressions on these students that you don't realize. When I fly with a new student, you know, I said, you're never gonna forget me. Like me or hate me, you're not gonna forget me. He goes, why is that? I says, because I'm gonna give you a line check here at Delta Airlines, and this is the first time you've ever been in an airline. So you'll never forget me. It, it just happens. I've had guys come to me, hey, GC, how you doing? I'm like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I got so, a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you, who here is running flight schools or does, does training of pilots that will put them in front of a PPE? Most of you guys at some point? So I had this experience with my IFR and my son had it with his VFR, which was that the oral portion of the date with the PPE it was like four hours. The flying portion was maybe one. Can you, you guys get flunked for the oral? Because both of us had the experience that uh, that was a person who was trying to transmit experience based thinking in a check ride that probably thought you could pass based on the technical mm -hmm. skills of the cockpit. You're probably going to be able to fly the airplane. And I was curious about that because. If there was a couple more doses of that during training, whether it be IFR or, or private pilot training, it would be enormously powerful. But the, the syllabus doesn't really call for a pause to work the hell out of you. It's always the next flight, the next thing. So I guess I was curious, is that DPE typical, that experience, where they just work the hell out of you? My son started at 8.30, and he did not fly until 2. For a private pilot, what kind of turn? Private, 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 private. Uh, that's not going to be No, it's not well, I think I, I probably the DPE in the room. <laughs> so it depends. It really depends. Sometimes at an exam, they probably average two hours on the oral, but a lot of depends on how well prepared that person is. I've had three, three and a half hour orals at 
So it, it really is a big depends. But bring it back to the topic of discussion, a way to really help prepare the person for their exam is to ask questions of them. So much of it is the instructors teaching, 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 and never makes that pre-exam pause to say, please explain to me what happens during the mag check. The DPE is going to ask that kind of question. And right. we don't embed that in our training with pilots. We're teaching them rote memorization things, right. understanding, but not necessarily. So as a DPE, if I say, oh my goodness, here we are flying across on your flight plan. The engine sounds like it's running rough. What do you do? Yes. Exactly scenario based. Yes. What the instructor could be doing throughout training, but instead they're going, okay, uh, if you have a car license, this is what you do. Yeah. You know, and instead of saying giving in the scenario, it's like, wait a minute, does that sound odd? What, what do you do? And instead of telling them what to do, or ask the question, please explain this to me. You know, well, so it's a, it's a different perspective on instruction, but... I, I only mention it because I thought that was really powerful. Uh, it wasn't scary for my son. It was like, oh, game on. Because he wasn't worried about what he was going to do in the cockpit. He was worried about whether this guy thought he had awareness and some judgment and some integrated knowledge, which when you're that new, you don't have much. So it, it kind of felt like teaching. I had the same experience. I just thought that was so cool. But it left him with the impression that the art form isn't whether I can do this. The art form is bringing this. In, in the airlines, we, we we tell people that once they get comfortable, they have, that could be a year yeah. to where you really feel comfortable. Yeah. In the real world, flying the airplane is the easiest thing we do. Yeah. It's everything else. Right. It's everything else. It's right. the CRM. And, that, and that's it's what I tell people too. And, you know, when I, when I upgrade them, I go, especially new hire, I go, you know, and it depends on what time of year I'm upgrading them. I said, you'll get, you need, you need a year. Because it's a different airline in January than it is in May. And it's a different airline oh, yes. in July than it is in September. One of the points I make to all of, all of our students is nobody, nobody here can fly. Bob Hoover couldn't fly. Do you think you can fly? Happily sell tickets for people, have people watch you run down, the, run, run down the runway and flap in your arms. Yep. The airplane flies. You're the brains of the operation. And that's what you have to bring to the table. And that's the Karen's point and Joe's point. Yep. One of the things that I have found in the experience instructor is I'll, I'll put, before we send anybody to a DP, I'll put them through their paces. Put them through their paces. And it ends up being a six hour conversation mm -hmm. split over two days going through everything, every possible question I can think mm -hmm. that I've seen DPEs ask. And going through the ACS. And the payoff is that the check right then is another that boom, 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 so one, yes, I, I definitely agree with this train of A few months ago, I actually wrote an article on the Socratic method and mm -hmm. plant structure. There you go. I'm hoping to expand on this in the future as well, because it's, it's a big part of the topic. But some things I would mention, one, I get transfers from other schools who are surprised by the fact I'm even asking them questions because they didn't even have ground, period. Really? Like, they just showed up. In fact, that one that was really scary. He showed up, instructor sent them out to pre flight. The pre flight was check the field, check the load, all the time. And they hopped in and they went flying. It was mostly bang and nothing. Right? Exactly. So when he transferred over, he was completely surprised by the method yeah. I was utilizing in the training. Was it? It was so much more engaging, mm -hmm. more interesting. It makes it better prepared. Right. And, but it does lead to much longer yeah. conversation yeah. as well. Right. Um, your time is valuable too. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The other thing about this the, uh, scenario based training and getting experience, um, so the flights will honor, I'm thinking of this logistically as well, utilization of resources and scheduling mm -hmm. and all those sorts of difficulties. Um, as we were just talking earlier about some trips that we were running to Nantucket recently. Um, and soon to Martha's Vineyard as well, because it's a nice grass field. But yeah, it's Amon. Oh, yeah. It's Amon. Absolutely lovely field. It's Amon. Yeah. So there's all these very interesting, we're flying the Logan, right? Taking students to yeah. Logan. That's one of the points in their training, right? I love that. The right. difficulty is the scheduling. Yes. Because by time, like just to go to Nantucket with one student, mm -hmm. okay? By the time we show up at 8 o'clock, pull the airplane out, pre flight, 
come in, discuss everything, go through the weather, get a full briefing, right? Answer all the questions that we can have about the flight. Try not to get too heavy because sometimes you just have to go out and do it, yeah. and then debrief. And it's on the debrief side that takes the longest yeah. after every flight. Five hours later, they're finally signing logbooks and walking out. Yeah. Try doing that in normal off. I mean, I do these on off days, yeah. right? Because we're kind of Wednesday through Sunday. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll do these flights on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, so of course I'm working maybe six, seven days a week sometimes when I do that. But it's a really good experience for them. Like, to either do that or to go somewhere else in New England because we have a lot of interesting places. Yeah, I love, I love it's it. It's an incredible experience. I'd love to do that with every single lesson. Maybe not go that far because mm -hmm. it's about 70 miles and it takes two and a half hours full flight to yeah. start to finish. But, uh, and we get breakfast too. And while we're having <laughs> breakfast, we're also <laughs> discussing and debriefing and talking about the flight home. So, to the student, it's such a much more interesting experience. And for me, it's also more interesting than just going out for an hour and doing some stuff and coming back. Now, there are times you have to do those sessions, yes. right? You have to go out and just work on maybe power on stalls and one other thing, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, but I find more value in that, that sort of longer experience. But it's just logistically incredibly difficult. Yes. So I, I appreciate that. So, so our time is up. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate everyone's attention and the interaction. That was what I was, I was hoping for. So uh, thank you for attending and 